It's episode 8 of my As a Bag of Hammers playthrough of Encased. Just finished getting myself my own room here in Magellan. There are still a bunch of people to chat with here, uh, a couple more quests to pick up, and hopefully we will get all of that done and then some today. First, let's have a chat with this guy. A deceived man in a dirty white coat slouches against the wall, taking deep drags on a cigarette. He looks like the poster child for fatigue and misery. A huge case made out of reinforced plastic sits beside him. The white occasionally leans over to rest one ear against the case and listen apprehensively. Ask him what he hears in there. The scientist sighs. In the case, it's complicated. He looks around shyly, then cracks the lid slightly so you can look inside. You see a porcelain white child's face amidst fold of crimson velvet. Its eyes are closed, its pale arms positioned along the body like a doll's. The white inhales half his cigarette in one drag with a hoarse wheeze. On closer examination, the body in the box is not that of a child. Actually, it's not even human. Blue antifreeze is dripping slowly from a small crack on its temple. Also, a bit of metal carcass is visible where the skin on one arm has been scraped. Sophie was playing in the lab. There's a high balcony in there. Did you see it? She fell. The white looks through you as he speaks. Since I'm assigned to another base, storage says they're not allowed to provide spare parts. He looks at you hopefully. Will you help me? You nod your understanding. No one knows why, but there have never been any pregnancies under the dome. Robo kids might not be the best solution, but the absence of other options has made them the most popular home robot model. Well, here's a use for fixer. Yeah. I'm not good with electronics, but I have something that I've never found a use for before. Here you go. You show him your electronics repair kit, and the white's face lights up. You'd make a really good specialist with that kind of gadgetry. Let's begin. Uh-oh. <laughs> Hopefully it's as simple as handing it to him. There's around 30 replacement parts and a detailed instruction booklet in the repair kit. The booklet features a cheerful bearded engineer smoking a pipe and drinking a tangerine vega drink so good. He explains in detail how to replace each of the RoboKid's major components. With the white's help, the robot is quickly repaired. The girl opens her eyes and the white gasps with joy. Daddy, is that you? She looks eerily alive, right down to her vinyl fiber eyelashes, quivering with simulated emotion. Daddy, please don't hurt me any- oh no. The white cigarette falls from his fingers and he presses her to his chest. Darling, my darling, he whispers, tears rolling down his cheeks. Turning to you, the white presses a hand to his heart. Thank you. I have nothing to give you but my eternal gratitude. Know that I will never forget what you've done for me. The scientist gives the girl a chast kiss on the cheek, then carefully loads her back into the case. He shakes your hand and leaves, listening to one side with the weight of the huge case. You know, robot or not, if there was an option to inquire further about her comment, I would, but, well, I guess, uh, for the sake of sleeping well tonight, <laughs> let's assume it was an accident. Let's see about bothering this guy here. I think we talked to him before. A man in an orange robe is sitting in the lotus position on a wicker mat. It's not a wicker mat. Muscular, tattooed arms resting on his knees. His badge says, Joran Lindbergh. His eyes are closed, but it seems he can hear every single sound. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that, <laughs> that kind of tracks. Shh. The orange raises two fingers, signaling you to stop. Ignore him and take a step forward. Lindbergh instantly jumps up and a knife falls from his right sleeve into his hand. One swift move later and he's next to you, the point of his steel blade tickling your Adam's apple. Okay, um, <laughs> there's a problem with that sentence, but okay. I'm all ears. The orange studies you for a few moments. Seeing you're unarmed, he returns the knife to its hiding place. Never do that again. Why are you here? Do we start by it? That's not a very Buddhist reaction. Uh, does he have a job for me? He shakes his head no. I want us to understand each other. The color of your uniform doesn't matter to me, but I must be certain that it doesn't matter to you either. Till then, no. I have no job for you. Is he a Buddhist? The orange folds his fingers into a mudra... A mudra? Okay. And freezes, looking down at his hands. Who's asking? He emphasizes the word, who. Well, let's get involved with the annoying banter. A person seeking an answer. He looks up at you. Then this is not the question you want to ask. Uh, but I bet you're going to tell me what it is. The orange stretches his whole body until its joints pop. You're not here to talk about Buddhism. Why are you here? Good luck. Well, that one got old quick. 
Heck, I talked a lot like I did when I was 13 years old and thought I was smart. It was also the classic video game trope of, oh, he got the drop on you, even though you have a deafness of 10. <laughs> I guess he had a deafness of 11. Let's not linger here. No offense, but I'm not too fond of your colleagues. Fair enough, Crump. So we've arrived in Advin. First up will be Artemis. The waiting room for Kingsley's office is suffused with the hum of air conditioners and warm human air. Behind the desk to the right of the door is a thin brunette in a fitted jacket and a blouse fastened at the neck. A nameplate on the table reads, Artemis Katsaros, Secretary. Hello. As you approach, the girl brushes something off the table and opens a big black notebook. Welcome to Chief Officer Kingsley's office. How can I help you? Can we go in? She puts her fingers together. Let the scanner read your selectron. Yes, right here. Artemis turns from the screen to you, clearly surprised. Oh, the emulator project. I won't make you wait. Mr. Kingsley told me to let emulator employees get to the head of the line. Say thank you. See ya. Kingsley. A small old man in a silver jacket is sitting in a big, comfortable-looking chair. You remember him. This is the TV geezer himself. Oh, good, we're getting back to this, are we? Another picture pops into your memory. A geezer from a TV standing knee-deep in white fog. Of course. You've met before. The old man adjusts his glasses and examines your face. It seems as though he recognizes you and doesn't recognize you at the same time. Shout, TV geezer, and spread your arms in joy. The silver wings expression clears. <laughs> now he knows who he's talking to. Yes, I remember you. You're the yellow badge who arrived the day before the incident and went to Nashville on my orders. He leans back in his chair. I'd give you our standard questionnaire, but you wouldn't understand a word of it. You got a closer look at Maelstrom than anyone else. To reiterate the question, what's your opinion on the phenomenon? I like both of these answers. Frown and make pounding motions with your fists. Maelstrom bad. Grr. Or say that Maelstrom is great, like a roller coaster, but more beautiful -er. <laughs> Uh Let's go with Maelstrom bad. Grr. TV <laughs> The text is calling him TV Geezer. At least you're aware of the danger the entity poses to humanity. Not bad for someone of your mental ability. He looks at you carefully. Okay, now that that's done, may I ask what you came to see me about? Pirouette over Kingsley's desk, arms spread and twirling like a little maelstrom. Martin curses, snatching at the loose papers flying around his office. Enough, employee, calm down. I understand. You've seen Maelstrom, you're showing me, and you're doing great. Wait. Maelstrom. Kingsley sits down and curiously looks you over. You're resistant to Maelstrom's psi effects, which means there's something you can do for the NC. Take a look at this map. This is the Gretel facility, a small experimental complex. We lost communication with it on September 14th, 1977. This sounds awfully familiar. <laughs> this point here is the Sonora storage bunker. The exact date we lost contact with them is unknown. Okay, but the final successful communication was in October of 76. Martin slides his finger across the screen and an empty square lights up with a check mark. The Kaleidoscope Project Bunker. Keep in mind, this site is classified. You have to think of a way to get inside. The director looks for a mark on the map for a while and then confidently points to it. And the Campbell Facility. Don't ask me what's going on there. No idea. They stopped responding shortly after the incident. Kingsley presses the button on his Kairos. I just sent you the coordinates for these facilities. I'll repeat the task. Reconnoiter, and come back here. That is all. Play shaving a haircut with your knees on the edge of the table and ask if there's anything you can do to help. Although I'm pretty sure that's the same thing. Aside from not destroying my office? No, nothing right now. He shakes his head. Eat an eraser off his desk <laughs> and move away. We have missions. Ooh, he's got turrets. I'm listening. A balding guy with a red beard and a name tag reading Rick McDougal tugs timidly on your sleeve. Excuse me, are you here to fix Minerva? This is the password. It's the long word. Then the number of the mainframe you're accessing squared. Without looking you in the eye, he extends a trembling hand. He's passing you a worn piece of paper with... Forget to... Okay, so I, I tried to think of some reference that this is making. It's not coming to mind. We're going to just say password from here on out, written on it. 
Ask where I could find a sledgehammer. You'll fix these unruly computers in short order. The guy's eyes go round. You, you no, this is pre precision equipment. H how would a sledgehammer help to fix things? Uh, excuse me. Struggling against its natural timidity, the blue finally looks at you with surprise. He backs away. Uh, excuse me? Are you not a technician? I thought you came to repair Minerva. So our first option is reassure him. What's the big deal? Even a moron can handle it. So it'll be a piece of cake for a beacon of enlightened thought like yourself. Well, that's kind of fun. I kind of like, say that fixing stuff is boring, but you could break things instead. Please, don't. This machine keeps all of Magellan running. Sagely pronounce floppy, then pat him on the back and move away. See you later. Okay, well, let's actually Hello see again. about uh, fixing the computers. He stares at you in disbelief. Sorry, but do you really know what needs to be done about the computer? Can you enter the password? That's the word on that paper, plus the square of the mainframe's number. 25 for mainframe number 5, 9 for 3, and so on. Excuse me. Later. You approach the powerful modern terminal. Its wide screen amicably awaits you. You could probably play games on this one. That's probably what the owner does all day long. Okay, so normally in games, puzzles like this, I kind of just gloss over, even if it means I miss part of the, the plot. But I'm guessing we're going to be able to have some fun with this. So, good day, Rick. Enter a command to open the desired menu item. Type on the keyboard that you want to play a game. You slowly poke the keys with your finger, formulating your request to the Dear Camputor. The arrogant computer responds to your request only when you desperately type in Game and press the Enter button. With the buzz of a hard drive, the machine starts to boot. Oh. Well, let's see where this goes. Welcome to the tremendous new game developed for you by Gigahard, <laughs> Gigahard Company, software division of Mobius Inc. Mobius Inc. Digital is the way of the future. Enter start. Okay, I'm pretty sure I would wind up with no voice after going through this whole thing, so we're going to have to skip it. Ha, you're just as weak as you look. Okay, let's show this pesky machine we know kung fu. And some fine kung fu that is. The terminal jumps and starts to load an email application. With a heartbreaking whirr, the system begins loading emails. Several minutes pass before the contents of the mailbox appear on the screen. Rick's inbox isn't exactly overflowing. There are a dozen old company newsletters, an email from a law office, and something unread from a guy named Steve. Slam on the keyboard until the system goes back to the main menu. Struggle to enter the funny word, journal. The fans buzz like a hive of pissed off bees. The screen displays the contents of the log, a single record. It looks like Rick isn't one for keeping records. Shake a threatening fist to the computer and move away. Under the logo it says, enter password. You look at the scrap of paper with the word password written on it. Rick said you were supposed to enter a number after it, but which one? <laughs> so again, we have a brains to check that we can't pass. Let's frown sternly and overcome. In a world where infinite numbers of monkeys are able to write war in peace, <laughs> there should be no unbreakable passwords. Rolling up your sleeves, you courageously persevere until you stumble upon the correct combination of symbols, which is the number one. After several attempts, you accidentally press them in the right order. Alan Turing is a pathetic jerk next to you. <laughs> you enter the necessary characters. Password accepted appears on the screen, and the main menu slowly begins loading. Stick out your tongue and use it to punch in the word storage. The word may look complicated, but in the end, the mighty human mind, represented by you, triumphs again. Lights blink, and the system starts loading something. The mainframe's magnetic drive is entirely filled with reactor room logs. You scan through the files, but don't find anything important. Angrily slam your face into the keyboard until the computer returns to the main menu. And with this one, let's experience an existential crisis of the weeping kind. You sit down by the server and watch the flickering green monochrome with an expression of deep philosophical thought. There, in deep space, stars are born and die, and the light of their explosions travels for billions of years to the observable borders of the universe to drown in the bottomless blackness of the cosmos. 
Somewhere people vote Republican, and somewhere deep underground, dinosaurs turn into oil. It's a shame all these amazing things are happening in the exact moment you're sitting here, unable to press a few buttons correctly. You bury your face in your hands and sob like a hopeless little bitch. <laughs> Frown sternly and overcome. Okay, so all of these computers said the exact same thing. I'm guessing that you need to have brains of two to actually be able to make any sort of progress here. Salutations. The worried looking silver with back swept hair is reading emails from his Kairos. He looks up at you and shakes his head in disapproval. What is that you're wearing? Put on a standard uniform. If you get into the news looking like that, lick his hair and ask why he's so sad. With a cry of horror, he pulls his head back and looks at you with round eyes. Well, maybe because a stranger licks me? Disgusting. Have you ever heard of personal boundaries? <laughs> Calms down a little. I hear fools get lucky. Maybe you'll get lucky with one case. It's simple. You just need to go to the old film set and look for the right person there. I need a TV host, a real genius of charisma. Here, look at the map. It's right here. Tussle his hair and move away. I mean, I don't know why I would do that Goodbye. for him, but... Why, well, I do know. It's a video game. What have we here? So the clothes there were all worse versions of stuff I already had, but all this lockpicking has gotten me another level. So we'll keep doing what we're doing. Ten more points into melee. Three more points into criminal. So with a nap pad and inventory emptied, I've returned to the laboratory to take a look at this ventilation access. Looks like we have some hostiles here, which are cryo in nature? Looks like they're cryogenic in nature. Let's see if we can get close to them because we're entirely melee, and then pick a fight. Alright, let's do it. I probably should have picked the fight when there was only one near me, but... Okay, so these are cryo enemies. Psychic damage should do nicely. 21 damage. How, how much is that? Okay, they're 170 uh, HP. And you're at the back line, so go ahead and save up your action points. I need you at the front, so get moving. Um, four action points, get into fighting stance. And go ahead and give it a punch. For 44 damage, nice. And I need myself in fighting stance as well. And what are we doing with 13? How does this work out? Okay, so one, two, three. That's a decent amount of experience there. All right, let's move forward one and save the rest. Make him come to me. Okay, Fox, you can keep, uh, keep up with the ranged attacks. Those are doing perfectly decently. So you see, because I saved the action points, now I can attack three times this round in the box. Crump, go ahead and move up. Hit him with the much more powerful uh, fists here. And give him the, uh, the quick jab. So it seems like these ones are melee exclusively. Go ahead and move Fox up a bit. Have her save up the uh, the AP. And I like the idea of making them come to me because then they use up the uh, the AP instead of well, instead of me. <laughs> oh, but there goes my character running away. That's the uh, the voice where uh, sometimes my character will lose their first turn in exchange for a whole ton of AP. That's 
a great start for uh, for Fox there. Go ahead and save the AP. And Crump, you go ahead and move up. Fist punch. I think at least one of those two words is extraneous. All right, now I can get into the action. Or I can run up and not get into the action, but <laughs> same thing, I guess. I don't want to be standing right next to it with... Well, no, I have the fighting stance up. Yeah, let's move right up. Uh, fist fight. Respect. That's a decent amount of uh, damage. That is a huge amount of damage. But I think I'll be fine. I think Fox will be able to take him down. And there we go. Uh. Be Whoa. careful out there. Ah! What are we taking damage from here? Not that interesting. Oh, he's got frostbite. That's why ah! he's taking damage. And a lot of it, too. Let's get you uh, fixed up there, Crump. Oh, was that another one of the same? Yeah. It's two of the same relic, which I probably won't be using. Decent pile of junk there. So I'm definitely not supposed to be in here, which is why I stealth before coming in. I am going to loot the heck out of it. This is a morgue, by the way. And if you recall, this guy a while back asked me to steal a ring. Or get back an heirloom. At least that's what he said, but let's be honest. He asked me to steal a ring. Let's have a look at Josh Bigsby. A body with a coffee-stained shirt lays on the morgue table. Inspect the body. The badge on the corpse's chest is covered in coffee, and the name is illegible. Let's take the ring. The corpse's hands are quite swollen, and you have to fiddle with his finger to twist the ring free. Okay, so Crump Jesus, and Fox decided to take the wrong way around and got frostbite. So much. Well, Jesus. when in Rome, <laughs> let's head through it ourselves. So we got some sort of... Ray gun? Ooh, high-tech weapons plus 15. Not that we'll ever use them, but that's kind of interesting. We'll go ahead and consume that right away. Companions can't use those, by the way, in case you're wondering. So you'll notice what I have found is a way to get from inside the lab, from the morgue, to here without going through decontamination. So we'll have a chat with these... Uh, these scientists again, you know what, I should get to the healing, and see if that changes their dialogue at all. The easiest way to get it out through decontamination is just not go through decontamination. Stand by for decontamination to end. Okay guys, I have a plan. Apparently you can't mention that you have a way to get it out. Oh well, let's talk to George Zerins and turn in some of our points, our forefather's points. Professor Zerins is examining a crystalline precipitate in a flask and muttering under his breath. Say you're about to ask what kind of forefather points are displayed on the screen of your handheld. Zerins inclines his head with an expression of total surprise. He's very good at looking absolutely <laughs> bewildered. He shuffles up to you like an old man. Aren't you ashamed to be so ignorant? This is the famous research support program. Through widespread cooperation, we're restoring the scientific potential we lost during the incident. You're embarrassingly underinformed. Nod your understanding. Everything is clear now. He taps the scanner lens with one finger. You get four father po Yeah, we know this already. <laughs> I want to trade for some necessities. I want reagents. Energon's good, though. Four father points. We will take reagents. Floor level minus seven. Reactor room. Uh, buddy, <laughs> you probably shouldn't just be, like, standing there if you're taking radiation. A short, gray-eyed orange is spinning some valves into the red zone. Neither the cackle of the Kairos dosimeter? Is that like a Gogger counter? Nor the warning signs all around seem to bother him. He stops well. you. Hey, don't stand in my light, okay? Marvel at the cool, crackling sound from the dosimeter. Bob your head in time. Standing alongside the orange, you start fiercely headbanging like you're at a rock concert. The orange smiles wryly. 
Well, shit, you're a real screwball. Move away, dancing jerkily to the dosimeter's crackling. Good luck. <laughs> Is he just gonna die there? Probably. <laughs> so this would be the power station that the people at the emulator need working. So it looks like we have Magellan working, but two other ones, the auxiliary and the emulator project, are not. Let's have a chat with Clayton. A disabled man in a dusty jumpsuit turns to you. His badge reads, Clayton Montgomery, electrician. He's holding a Care OS commands guide. Show him who's the real electrician here. Grab two cables, tie them into a knot, and growl menacingly. Well, hello there. Clayton looks at you sympathetically. Nature wasn't very kind to you. <laughs> he pulls himself together and offers you a hand. Anyway, my professional duty requires me to build partnership relationships with anyone, even proper idiots. Clayton Montgomery, electrician. Pleased to meet you. Shout, emulator, and begin dancing vigorously. The blue opens his mouth, amused. So you were the person I was told was working for the emulator? Most unusual. Well, in that case, I'm to explain to you what's going on here. He looks at the control panel. Here's the situation. The mainframe distributes the power from the reactor to the emulator systems. Right now it's functioning on reserve power supply, which isn't enough to run even the support systems for the circuit diagnostics. Alas, my knowledge about computers is clearly insufficient. You're an electrician. Leave, shooting imaginary lightnings from your fingers. I hope to see you again soon. Okay, well, I, I'm guessing he was supposed to explain to me how all this worked. Well, trial and error it is. <laughs> this is a large mainframe controlling the power supply system. The message on the faded screen reads, Emulator Project, Emergency Mode. There's a table below with lots of numbers and all kinds of complicated words. There are two levers beside the terminal. The terminal looks quite alright from the outside, yet as a proper engineer you know the main problem is always inside. Now is the time to discover it. Kick off the terminal casing. <laughs> the metal thing creaks in fear, revealing its cable enlaced insides. There are some identical circuit boards with metal legs, thick braids of wires, several large fans, and a dead rat inside the device. Put the dead rat in another place. <laughs> you move the dead rat from one spot on the circuit board to another. The mainframe beeps, its screen flickering. <laughs> the device continues buzzing. At least you didn't break it. That's a good start. Do some other engineer-like stuff. Your experienced engineer's gaze runs over the marvelous layer of dust covering the mainframe casing from the inside. There are definitely plenty of options here. You may swap the circuit boards around, tug at the cables, spin the fans, or play with the rat that was so kind to die inside the terminal. <laughs> the first time I did this, the options were things like start the auxiliary generator, or close the circuit breaker, things like that, and there was a specific order that you had to do them to get the thing to start, and it's just starting to hit me that that's what I'm supposed to do <laughs> with these options here. This should be fun. Let's start by pulling the second lever. As you pull the lever, you receive a significant electric shock. The system definitely needs tuning. Jerk your hand back. Stunned. <laughs> Enraged. <laughs> let's try again. Okay, let's start by swapping some circuit boards around. You definitely swap some circuit boards around. The mainframe buzzes, lights flickering. Look at the screen. Okay, 4 out of 20. Auxiliary systems are disabled, not enough power to run the auxiliary systems. Pull the first lever. Oh, <laughs> that's the electric shock again. Okay, so circuit boards, other engineer-like stuff. How about the cables? You plug the cables out of one socket and into another. Your actions are accompanied by a beautiful fountain of sparks. You're on the right track. Look at the screen, 15 out of 20. Okay, so circuit boards, then cables, other engineer-like stuff. Spin a fan. The fan spins with a funny sound. How exciting. Nothing else happens, though. Okay, that didn't do anything. 15 out of 20. <laughs> um, other engineer-like stuff. Uh, now we move the rat. You move the dead rat from one spot to another. The mainframe beeps, its screen flickering. 
Look at the screen, 15 out of 20. Okay, so I probably want to turn some... <laughs> oh my god. Um, okay, maybe we have to do the circuit boards again. 15 out of 20. Okay, well, maybe now we start mucking with levers? Nope. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's start with the dead rat. <laughs> 20 out of 20. Oh, okay. Um, pull the first lever. You pull the first lever. The lights turn green. Indicator arrows of the device around you shudder, coming to life. A soft, steady electrical buzz fills the office. Looks like you managed to fix the power flow. Dance the engineer dance and leave. That process is exactly the same process I used to solve it the first time. Hmm. That's not good. Forgot something? Thump yourself on the chest and depict moving levers. Ooh, I saw you examining the control panel, but I couldn't imagine you'd do it. I need to take the readings, if you please. He bends over the panel. He turns towards you again. If I got the diagnostic results right, one should visit the mechanical floor beneath the reactor room. It might be the wiring that burned, but I'm 99% sure it's the fuse. Alas, I can't go myself. I'm to stay here and control the readings. I'll be grateful if you take the 450A fuse and replace the burnt one with it. The blue offers you a small device and spreads his hands guiltily. Run off crying, wa pa 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 and clapping yourself on the cheeks. So before I go downstairs, I'm going to see what's to be seen up in this corner of the world. Come on, Link, calm down. You see two oranges. One of them is sitting against the wall looking gloomy, the other pacing back and forth with his hands behind his back. Looks like they're arguing about something. Well, hello there. The red-haired guy wearing the duct tape spectacles notices you first. He stops pacing and offers you his hand. Doug Preston, and that sad monkey in the corner is my friend Link Child. Idiot. The orange sitting on the floor snaps morosely. Why are you sitting here? Preston encourages you to sit down. The three of us, Link, Harold, and I typically work together. His mate sighs gloomily, shaking his head. We used to work together. Doug rolls his eyes. Here we go again. Link's convinced something's bad happened to his brother Harold. Harold entered the ventilation system to replace some fuses, and he still hasn't come back. Could you please see if you can find Harold? I'm claustrophobic and Link, uh, it's a long story. Okay. Doug shakes your hand. Thank you, and please be careful, just in case. Goodbye. First we'll look at this broken electronic device. The fuse box is broken, the doors of the housing vent aside. You can see damaged cables within. Perform express repairs with a powerful kick. The simplest solution is always the best. This is why the true genius of electrical engineering gravitates towards a simple approach. You give the fuse box a few juicy kicks and suddenly everything starts working. Oh, here's a valve. Bingo. Oh, okay, so we have combat waiting for us down here. Well, in true RPG fashion, we'll go the wrong way around. Where we find dead bodies, that's great. With drugs. <laughs> we have an orange wing employee that is going to be hostile. Let's see if we can actually take this one down without killing him. Okay, so we're starting with the one that doesn't actually have a... Oh, she does have a fatigue attack. Well, let's move her in. And we're gonna go with defense in the interim. Someone touched us? Covered our place with their scent? So we have Crump first. I believe Headbutt? <laughs> headbutt does a different amount of damage depending on what glove you're wearing. Um, Okay, so I think it's Karate Chop. Yeah, Karate Chop does fatigue damage. Ah! Yeah. Let's do defense. I think I should actually have a couple options for fatigue because I have blunt, uh, blunt weapons. Wear down. Okay.
Well, given my proximity, let's go with uh, defense class. Break out the fatigue damage from Fox. I double check that this is actually fatigue damage. Oh, I've been misreading this. No, effects on self is fatigue. Well, let's do Psy Confusion. And, yeah, we don't have any fatigue choices on, on Fox. So, let's go ahead and just go with Defense Class. And do we want to do a Headbutt? Let's stun the target for a round. We'll do the, the lesser damaging one. And then a karate chop. Ugh. Extreme fatigue. Okay. So we took him out without killing him. Without taking a lot of damage. Whoops. <laughs> um, okay, is there a way to interact with him? I mean, I do want to search him, but... Okay, well, he's alive. I wonder if I'm supposed to kill him. I mean, that would be easy to do, <laughs> considering he's unconscious. I think I will just leave him there. Oh, you again. Preston looks at you expectantly. I'll remind you of the main point. Harold is late. I think he's replacing a fuse of the main board inside the ventilation system, but it's been way too long. Tell him about the corpse. Preston falls silent and adjusts his duct tape spectacles with an unsteady hand. That's it then. Link says nothing, but his expression is petrified. The orange's eyes fill with tears. Doug scratches his head. Can you tell him what killed him? Say that you found the afflicted in the ventilation shaft and knocked him out. Oh, knocked him out. Okay. So there is specific, well, I guess dialogue for knocking someone out instead of killing them. Doug's expression turns vengeful for a moment. Okay, thank you. We'll pay him a visit. So it's, he's not going to do too well anyway. Buddy over here is still just taking radiation. He will die. And i got to imagine it's a thousand points in the need. Well, at least that's what it is in Fallout. This game definitely borrows pretty heavily from Fallout. Though the elevator looks neglected, it's apparently in regular use. A large number of dusty tracks lead from it, clearly visible on the clean floor. The elevator's control panel is dim and the door is ajar. Between the gap and the doors, you see an emergency ladder leading downwards. Squeeze into the elevator and climb down the ladder. The metal box smells of something burned. At a closer look, you find a black spot on its lid. Of course, someone must have prepared fried eggs on it. Change the fuse. You extract the melted off fuse and install the new one. It feels cool, almost like a Meccano set. Hear a soft hum. The little green light beside the fuse begins flickering at once. Wink back at the flickering lights and leave. And back away quickly. Now we're starting to get bored. The electrician greets you with a long, firm handshake. I'm endlessly thankful. It's working. The human intellect, even yours, again prevails over the unpleasant circumstances. Thump yourself on the chest proudly. He hasn't seen you turn on the light in the darkness yet. These are all leave. I don't think the emulator's on. Well, okay. Come back again. Okay, so the emulator's still on emergency shutdown. We'll start by pulling the second lever. You pull the second lever. The lights respond with a green flickering wave and a new light appears on the panel. Done! The emulator is now powered. Move away from the terminal. Well, right. As for our friend here, we have a ring for him. And I was starting to get bored. As you approach, Enrique gazes around to make sure no one is listening. Oh, that's not suspicious. What is it now? I was my kinsman, happily lying around doing nothing. Did you find the ring? Now, I'm pretty darn sure that he's trying to steal this ring, but, uh... uh who am I to judge? Here you go. <laughs> you pass the ring to Enrique, and he immediately secretes it into the folds of his clothes. Secretes it. I think they meant secrets it. The orange rests a heavy hand on your shoulder. Thank you. Ask about the reward? <laughs> he flashes you a condescending smile. Sorry, I'm strapped right now. I'll get into you later. <laughs> Let's see about fixing Buddy's car. I can't believe it. This is just the worst. 
Oh, hello there. Stalvardi looks under the hood with interest. Oh, the engine. That's the culprit behind my suffering. It's too bad I know nothing about mechanics, but I'm sure glad you do. How are things going? Oh. See ya. I guess we have to fix the car directly. Red Jupiter Moon, 72. If you look under the hood, you'll find a small, shoddily made piece of machinery. A rotor with a mesh body into which a glowing, wire-wrapped rod has been inserted. It looks nothing like an engine, but this device should set the vehicle in motion. Let's pop in the new CPS. The new CPS grows much more brightly than the old. As soon as you insert a new rod in the rotor, the device begins spinning weakly on its axis, and an orange telltale on the body lights up. Come on, don't be shy. Say you install the new CPS and the car is now in working order. Seriously? Seriously? You are a lifesaver. He gets into the car and turns the key in the ignition. The car starts. Salvardi's wild delight is obvious, even above the roar of the burnt out muffler. He cuts the engine and jumps out of the car. You are amazing. If this were the Middle Ages, you'd be burned at the stake for sure. Here, take it. It's for you. Please accept my gratitude. It was nice chatting. What did he give me? Not much. <laughs> I was hoping in the end that I'd be leaving with that car, but I guess that wasn't how that was going to play out. Well, if nothing else, I got some reputation out of it. I was really hoping that I was going to walk away with that car, though. <laughs> well, drive away. While I was looting this parking lot when I came past here before, I came across some enemies, but I decided not to deal with them immediately. Suspect something. As usual, we will let them come to us. Okay, so how do we want to take care of this? We will move Crump up. Yeah. yeah, okay, we move Crump up. We will put him in fighting stance. We're not going to headbutt a rat. Um, let's just punch it. And kill it. And get some defense class. And that leaves me with a million AP. Oh, I should have hit it with the sword for the third hit. Or the second hit. We'll go ahead and go defense on mine as well. Which one are we going to kill first? Let's start with the one on the left. If we can hit it. And we will save the remaining AP. Whoa. Okay, so apparently these rats can do psi attacks of their own. Okay, so I have the next attack. So I think Crump can reasonably start getting to work on this rat here. Did he kill it in one shot? Looks like he did. All right, well, let's go ahead and see if Crump can just finish this one off as well. And you will save AP, and I will move forward. So with eight AP left, let's do two hits with the sword. Get a crit. Let's see what we can do about this last one here. Grab Fox. What's your range like? Not that much. Get back here. I uh, didn't get the shot off. Okay. Now let's give it another. And... Let's go with defense class. Okay, so Crump is still in a wrestling stance. Let's move him forward to protect Fox and put him in defense here. That leaves me. 
And now that I've closed the distance, fighting stance. And I have time for three hits with the club. Oh! No, not crump. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, well, defense class it is. <laughs> Luckily, that was a pretty weak hit. Um, did that, like, lose any points with Crump or anything? Didn't piss him off? No? So sometimes in the outdoors you'll get random events at the uh, location such as Magellan. In the afternoon, the Magellan Station parking lot is under attack. Scurry ensues and you realize that something is wrong. You decide to find out who's interrupting your peace and quiet. Turns out that a group of hostile raiders are clearly preparing to attack. You understand that a fight is inevitable. Okay, well, we'll see if we can flank them. That's sort of how I'm reading. Try to hide by attacking the enemy while they can't see you. Yeah, let's see about a flank. Well, <laughs> so much for that. Wait, is it my... Okay, that makes more sense. I thought it was my character that was going to be getting the first turn. Oh, I was trying to flank uh, <laughs> the uh, security here. Was well, this an enemy? I can't actually tell. I I'm guessing everyone who shows up is orange is enemy. Okay, so this guy won't be an enemy. Okay, that's actual security. Let's go ahead and open fire with uh, some psi attacks. Huh? What? Hmm. What the? <laughs> And we will bank some Take defense. Take these creeps downtown, bros. What the hell are you doing here? I'll smack you up. It Would have been a bit surprised died. if he was actually able to cross all that distance and still do some damage. <laughs> okay, so we have a security it, guard back there that will want to make sure... Uh, Manages to survive this. Get Crump into fighting stance. Ooh! Nicely done, Crump. Alright, I think... We just get out of stealth, because I think we move faster outside of it. Do we support him? Yeah. Let's get involved in this over here. And while it means I'm only going to get in two attacks, let's get into Fighting Stance. Fighting Stance increases the damage of melee and, well, of all, you know, immediate vicinity attacks. So it's worth it uh, either way. Okay. Alright. So back to Fox, we'll drop some more side damage. You're dead, asshole. Huge side damage. Ugh. They have ranged weapons, so I do want to have uh, the defense class. Uh. Ooh, nice shot, All security right. guard. You're dead meat. Damn, need to reload. Drop your weapon. Wait. Okay, so this person shot at... Okay, so mental note, I don't think this is an enemy despite the fact they're dressed as orange. Although I shouldn't be assuming that they're enemies just because they're dressed as orange, but that seems to be uh, the theme, at least. Get moving forward, Crump. And I should be able to take this guy down with a basic weapon. And run all the way forward. At least Fox has some decent initiative. Although missing is not uh, is not what we're looking for. A crit makes up for it. And Fox, go ahead and well, skip your turn. Nothing. Ah! That's it. Your ass. Is That's it. Your ass is grass. Ooh. 
to know what. So it looks like we managed to get through that with no casualties on the part of the security, which is nice. That should wrap up Magellan for, well, for quite some time until we've wrapped up a whole bunch of the, uh, the quests we picked up here. We've also completed the reactor bit for the emulator project. Next time, we will have to start checking some of these missions off the list, but that'll have to wait for episode 9, and I will see you then.